volcanoes, earthquakes, tidal waves, and fires. These are cataclysms that are capable of wiping out thousands of lives in a terribly short space of time. Then there are epidemics and pandemics, particularly chilling in their own way, because they literally and figuratively get under the skin. Let's not forget man-made disasters. Industrial accidents and environmental disasters epitomize the worst side of the human species on this fragile blue-green planet. And what is more frightening than a nuclear calamity? Accidents on the road, on rail, in the air and at sea. They may not have quite the same deadly power as volcanoes or earthquakes, but they too hold their terrors and are responsible for thousands of fatalities every year. In this sobering yet thrilling installment of Desperate Hours, we take a look at some of the worst of the worst. So fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a rough ride. We begin with a reminder of a volcano in Iceland, which has not claimed a single life as yet. But it is a very forceful reminder of the awesome power of nature. Iceland has 30 active volcanoes and is known as the land of ice and fire. But it's a volcano with a hard to pronounce and even harder to spell name that in 2010 reminded everyone that mother nature is truly the boss. It's called Eyjafjallajökull. Jokulet. Today, most of the UK remains covered by the ash cloud. When Eyjafjallajökull erupted in 2010, it produced an enormous cloud of volcanic ash, which halted air travel throughout Europe. It wasn't even a particularly strong eruption, but flights across the continent were stopped for six days in April the most severe disruption to commercial flights since World War II. We don't know anything. We don't know how to get home. We don't know how to get any information uh, about what to do. And we don't have anywhere to stay. Iberia put us up for a few nights and gave us food. Put us on today's flight. Today's flight's cancelled and now they say they're not going to give us any more accommodation or any food. Eruption. It may stop tomorrow, but it may continue to disrupt air traffic for weeks or months. And according to the experts, Eyjafjallajökull Joklet is still geothermally active and could erupt again any time. From a natural disaster that, in some respects, is still waiting to happen, to one with tragic repercussions that are still being felt. On April 25, 2015, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake shook the mountainous country of Nepal, killing 8,000 people and injuring many more. Entire villages were obliterated and hundreds of thousands of people were rendered homeless. Because it was so suffocating inside, I couldn't breathe. People die inside the, I mean the dead body inside the house. It's a nightmare. The loss to Nepal's cultural heritage is harder to put a price on. But dozens of centuries old buildings at UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the Kathmandu Valley were reduced to nothing in a matter of minutes. The initial earthquake was followed by continuous aftershocks, which went on for days at 15 to 20 minute intervals. Aftershocks can occur from days to weeks to, to months and sometimes even years after the main shocks. I mean, it's, it's within the time period for sure to expect aftershocks like this. The Nepalese capital of Kathmandu is situated on a section of the Earth's crust around 120 kilometers wide and 60 kilometers long. This entire landmass shifted three meters to the south in less than 30 seconds during the quake. 
The April 2015 earthquake also triggered an avalanche on Mount Everest, which killed at least 19 people. This death toll made for the highest ever number of casualties on Everest in recorded history. Well, I'm pretty well fucked. Uh, I fell through that hole. Thankfully, I didn't keep falling that way. I got trapped here instead. For this ledge, my arm, I can't use. Adding insult to injury on a terrible scale, two weeks later, Nepal was hit by another major earthquake. This one with a magnitude of 7.3. Even with all our sophisticated technology, there is no way to prevent earthquakes or accurately predict them either. But do we stand any more of a fighting chance when it comes to preventing the spread of disease? Epidemics like SARS, Ebola, and avian bird flu. Just hearing these names is enough to give one pause. Ebola, Ebola, even just from the sound of the name Ebola, it's frightening, you know, it's scary. Over the last 30 years, the World Health Organization has seen the emergence, on average, of one new communicable disease per year. Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Bailey now. What's more, this incidence of new syndromes is on the rise. Factors such as climate change, as well as population growth and over-dependence on antibiotics, all serve to increase the likelihood of new diseases emerging and spreading to new populations. And if that wasn't alarming enough, the World Health Organization has made the point that we are also seeing the return of diseases like cholera and malaria, previously thought eradicated. Medical research looks for new ways to prevent diseases from becoming epidemics. But how can we seriously ever hope to stop the spread of disease? A particularly potent reminder of what can happen when we play with fire took place on the 12th of August 2015, when two enormous explosions in Tianjin, China, set fire to large parts of the northern Chinese port city. Dozens of people were killed, hundreds more injured, and the fires would take firefighters days to put out. Like a nuclear explosion was the phrase both news reporters and eyewitnesses repeatedly used to describe the initial explosions. <laughs> The chemistry explosion ruined the whole area around one kilometer. Indeed, the two massive blasts which occurred in the city's warehouse district were so large they were visible from outer space. As firefighters did their best to battle the fires that broke out around the site, toxic smells were discernible in the air. It was finally confirmed that there had been several hundred tons of sodium cyanide, the toxic chemical present on the site at the time of the blasts. Nothing fuels a fire like wind, and some ill winds blow nothing but destruction in their wake. 
Just ask anyone who lives in what they call Tornado Alley in the central part of the United States. They can tell you what kind of damage wind can do. As could any survivor or eyewitness of Hurricane Sandy. One of the most devastating hurricanes of the last 100 years and listed as the second most costly ever in financial terms, Superstorm Sandy's greatest impact was on New York and New Jersey. And it's not as if there was no warning. Sandy was formed in the Central Caribbean on October 22, 2012 and traveled through Jamaica, eastern Cuba and the Bahamas, changing from a hurricane to tropical storm and back to a hurricane on the way. So sobre Jamaica con una intensidad de huracán categoría 1, con 130 km por hora vientos máximos sostenidos y rachas de hasta 150, 160. The storm is uh, certainly um, it's still a hurricane for one thing and it's uh, now spinning just north of the Bahamas. And um, you can see from this satellite picture with uh, Carolina up here and Florida here, it's, it's becoming a very large storm system. When Sandy finally hit the eastern seaboard, there was destruction on an enormous scale and a death toll of over 200 people. We passed through the worst, you know, it's over us now, I guess, right? Doubtless the number of casualties would have been higher were it not for the warnings issued as the hurricane made its way. In the case of the Indian Ocean tsunami, such warnings were few and far between. December 26th, Boxing Day, 2004. In the depths of the Indian Ocean, there is a 9.0 magnitude earthquake. The energy released is equivalent to that of 23,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs, according to the US Geological Survey. That destructive power is quickly felt. A surge of powerful waves spreads across the Indian Ocean at speeds of up to 800 kilometers per hour. The room's filled up within 30 seconds, first of all, to about three foot, and then we all got out of the rooms, and then uh, um, one of our friends has had to go to the hospital, he couldn't get out of the room, he woke up and was uh, asleep on his bed, lying in, uh, on, woke up in, in water, had to throw the TV through the window to climb out. Hundreds of thousands are killed in minutes, and millions lose their homes as wave after destructive wave crashes into the coastlines of some 11 Indian Ocean countries. In Indonesia, the tsunami waves extended as far as five kilometers inland. People were dragged out to sea, drowned on the beach or in their homes, and there was wholesale and widespread damage to the environment and to property on a scale that's hard to comprehend. The official casualty count was eventually put at 227,898. A strange phenomenon, and one more frequently reported in the media in the last decade, is the curious incidence of the sinkhole. Most of them form slowly over time. Others, like this one in Bosnia, appeared suddenly out of nowhere. In this remote village in Bosnia, townspeople were astounded when their local pond disappeared. <laughs> Tek sam onda prijetio, vidio da je odšla velika vrba, nema nigdje. 
potonula, jezero je nestalo, samo je vrata rastuli. I kad znamo kakve su karakteristike jedne i druge formacije, nije čudo što ima ovakva jedna pojava na ovom mjestu, jer ovo nije neuobičajeno da se javlja na kontaktu takve dvije geološke formacije. Nije česta, ali u geologiji je poznato da... Sinkholes principally occur in what's called karst terrain. Soluble bedrock, like gypsum or limestone, is dissolved by water over time. Whether it's over a short period of time or a millennia, as the holes grow, there will come a day when the surface layer simply gives way. In March 2011, a fatal earthquake and tsunami combination triggered a fault line at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, leading to one of the worst nuclear disasters of our times. According to the Japanese Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency, the amount of radioactive cesium that spilled into the atmosphere following the partial meltdown was equivalent to 168 of the A-bombs used in Japan in 1945. The consequences of this nuclear catastrophe are still being felt today. In fact, we may not know for some time yet how bad the effects may be. Kongo. その土壌戦士の何しろどうなんのとその今までのうちいつ戻れんの戻れんの戻れないのそれすらわかんないすごい心配だったです子供たちも被爆してるんだなと思って子供たちの方が大事だったんで<笑> half a decade after the incident occurred Radioactive water was still spilling into the northern Pacific Ocean from the Daiichi nuclear power plant. If the worst predictions come true about the nuclear accident at Fukushima, you may well be hearing about it for decades to come. Nuclear power doesn't even have to be involved for industrial accidents to inflict great damage and suffering. Case in point, more than 30 years after it occurred, the consequences of the Bhopal gas disaster are still being felt. Even to this day, December 3rd remains a day of mourning in the Bhopal province, in remembrance of a deadly industrial accident at the Union Carbide gas plant in 1984. That morning, strong winds carried a grey cloud of poisonous gas over the factory walls and across the city. Some 40 tonnes of the toxic gas methysocyanate, or MIC, spread through the city with swift and disturbing effect. It's estimated that 10,000 people died within the space of a few hours. The defenseless residents of Bhopal had woken up to clouds of the suffocating gas and then ran through poorly lit streets to local hospitals. Many arrived already suffocating and blinded with untold damage to their muscles, brains, lungs and eyes, their gastrointestinal, neurological, reproductive and immune systems. Half a million people were injured, many of them suffering in terrible pain. In many ways, uh, people are worse than they were on the morning of the disaster. There are at least 150,000 people with chronic illnesses as a result of their exposure to the toxic gases. And uh, now we know that the next generation is also marked by Union Carbide's poisons. Mm. 
Misfortune at sea has been part of maritime life since early man built the first seagoing vessels. There is a certain grim inevitability about the confluence of high seas misadventure mixing with the devastation of a large-scale industrial accident. The Exxon Valdez oil spill was at once the kind of tragedy that is waiting to happen and one that could have been avoided. When it ruptured, the tanker proceeded to then spill 11 million gallons of crude oil into Alaska's Prince William Sound. 1,300 miles of coastline was despoiled. Thousands of marine animals, such as harbor seals and sea otters, as well as rare creatures, such as some 20 killer whales and 200 bald eagles, were all killed in the wake of the spill. Television beamed heartbreaking scenes of helpless animals around the world, birds covered in oil and trying to lick themselves clean, only to die soon after from the toxins in the oil. There will never be full recovery from the Exxon Valdez oil spill, period. This has to you know, be figured into our risk calculus about oil development, drilling, transportation, pipelines, shipping, anywhere and everywhere. We have to simply be honest about what the potential risks are. Of course, oil that doesn't leak into the ocean winds up in automobiles, and they too come with their share of dangers. Simply getting in your car and going for a drive comes with its inherent dangers. It's been estimated that over 3,000 people a day are killed in automobile accidents and over 20 million a year are hurt ranging from minor injuries to the most severe. The vast majority of fatalities take place in developing countries, where road safety takes a back seat to progress. HIV does not kill as much as road traffic incident is taking on a daily basis. On Nigerian road, we lose on average 100 lives daily. There is no doubt that inventions such as the motor car and the jet airliner have accelerated humanity's progress, making the world a smaller place. If ever there was a symbol of that progress, it would have had to have been the distinctive drooping nose and triangular-shaped wings of this magnificent flying machine, the Concorde. It could reach a speed of Mark II, about 2,140 kilometers per hour, twice the speed of today's commercial jet airliners. All that came to an abrupt end in July 2000, when Air France Flight 4590 caught fire, fell out of the sky and went crashing to Earth, just minutes after takeoff. Over the shoulder of uh, my interviewee was uh, the aircraft with a huge plume of, of uh, fire and smoke from uh, the left-hand side, um, 20 to 30 feet long, definitely on fire and definitely in trouble. 113 people were killed when the Concorde crashed into an airport hotel, including all the crew and passengers and four people on the ground. According to investigators, it was a piece of metal which had fallen onto the runway from a continental plane which caused the crash. Flight AF4590 was the first fatal crash in Concorde's 31-year history. And yet, it was the beginning of the end for Concorde and an era of supersonic travel. Within two years, all Concords were taken out of service. Yes, the world can be a very dangerous place. To be fully alive means being aware of the dangers, yet somehow facing each day with a mixture of stoicism and good humor. Even if we as a species do take better care of the world we live in, accidents will still happen, and sometimes on an enormous scale. There will always be desperate hours and days, 
but life goes on, and for that, we must be grateful.